morning and welcome to getting started with Spring and the Spring Source Tool Suite. For those of you who are perhaps more experienced users of the Spring Framework and have, have already uh, used it a bit, you might still have something you can take away from this webinar and, and, and we encourage you to stay of course, but this is, uh, to be clear, an introductory webinar to both Spring and uh, the Spring Source Tool Suite, the premier editor for Spring-based applications. So a little bit about me quickly. My name is Josh Long. I'm the Spring Developer Advocate for Spring Source. I'm contributing to some of the various projects at uh, Spring Source. I'm also an author. I've written, a, I don't know, three books, and the most prolific of which is probably uh, Spring Recipes Second Edition. And I'm also kind of out, I'm, I'm out there in the community. You'll see me as the uh, Java editor for InfoQ.com, info and I'm a blogger and so on. Okay. So. I work for SpringSource, uh, which is now a division of VMware. Right? SpringSource is the company that has stewarded the growth of the uh, Spring framework for the last, you know, for the balance, for the better part of the last decade. And uh, in 2009, because of the great success of the Spring framework itself uh, and the ancillary projects around it, uh, VMware acquired SpringSource. And now together we work to build the easiest, most powerful platform and uh, you know, end-to-end -end stack for developers. We have not just a great tech, you know, portfolio of technologies and, and, and projects, all of, you know, mostly open source and definitely accessible, but we also have a great collaboration with great, great partners in the industry. So we bring, we make Spring the, the premier way to bring your applications to those platforms as well. Uh, and this is actually a good thing. We work very hard and we spend a lot of time to simplify these things because Frankly, software development is getting very, very complex. I mean, if you, I'm sure as you, you're all probably very aware, uh, technology is increasingly more difficult to, to grasp and increasing, <clears throat> increasingly uh, more complicated requirements are coming in all the time. And this is something we have to change, we have to cope with. This is something we have to change though, you know. It, it shouldn't be this difficult to build uh, applications today. And of course, with today's economy, we're increasingly being asked to deliver more with a smaller budget and with less resources, right? And thankfully, things are, some things are afoot that allow us to meet these times, but this is not the norm, right? The Spring Framework aims to reduce the complexity and provide simplicity, and we'll talk about that through the balance of the webinar, but just keep this in mind. This is a very important thing. We want to make your lives easier, and we want to make you more proficient, more productive, right? The Spring Framework is all about innovation and portability in service to productivity. Having said that, we're not the only option out there, right? And uh, frankly, the, uh, the other guys aren't helping, right? If you look at the alternatives, it's uh, kind of this confusing mesh of disparate frameworks and component models that don't agree with each other, and it's also moving very slowly. The current state-of-the-art alternative is uh, six years old, right? And it's moving at an even, glacial, even more glacial pace for the next iteration. The design uh, espoused by that alternative is something that reflects the designs and requirements of 2005, not 2011, and heaven forbid, 20, 2012, and so on. Um, so we'll see, hopefully we'll see, uh, you'll see as we progress that the uh, Spring Framework is now, the Spring Framework is now uh, the, the solution for tomorrow's applications as well as today's. At its core, the Spring Framework is, it's several things. We, we talk about this triangle quite a bit, right? It's a, it's a way to remove tedium and a way to remove uh, uh, the sort of plumbing code that you don't want to have to concern, concern yourself with, right? Most applications have sort of an, uh, an intrinsic amount of complexity that's related to the problem they're trying to solve. It's related to the, the actual domain of the application. And then there's uh, extra complexity that is there and it's introduced as a consequence of using the technology choice that you've chosen. And at the, with the Spring Framework, we try and make it so that the intrinsic complexity is the only complexity, right? That the rest of the code just gets out of your way. Um, with the Spring Framework, we we aim to make uh, make it so that the premier component uh, with which you're supposed to solve solutions is a regular Java object, right? We we elevate that to the first class citizen that it should be, and then we do everything we can in service of that. Part of that is we provide uh, aspect-oriented programming, which you'll see. Uh, quite a bit, you know, in the framework itself, and you can use it, of course, if you want. But it's also it's it's nice to know that it's under it's there, 
under the hood, right? It's a way of addressing uh, certain problems in a single place and then having that solution uh, apply across a, a swath of objects, if you will, right? Uh, we also provide dependency injection, which is it's a nice word for saying we support management of the object graph, management of the objects in your application and the collaborating objects there as well. Um, both of these things are features that we do transparently for your code. Um, you don't have to know about them. You don't have to, uh, to, to, they don't impact your code base at all, right? The last part where we can't transparently automatically, uh, you know, do for your code what you want to do, uh, we provide APIs. And that's the in enterprise service abstractions piece. That part is also very important, right? We provide simplifying APIs across a broad uh, collection of different realms where you can actually simplify your code base. So all three of these things work together and they make your, and they promote your object, your, your ideas, your concept, your domain model. Generally, Spring is all about simplicity, as I say, and it achieves this by layering itself uh, in a clean way on top of your deployment target. A lot of people deploy Spring applications to, uh, of course, the cloud. That's an increasingly popular option today and, and something we see a lot more adaption of you know, every day. Uh, there are popular options there. Amazon Web Services and Google App Engine, uh, of course, are, are some of them. Google App Engine is actually a pretty interesting case in of itself because it's a very exotic environment and it's very hard to work there uh, reliably because they have a white list of classes. Well, Spring works there. We, we work there very, very, very easily and very few other options can say that, you know. Uh, similarly, we also work on uh, VMforce, which is the product of a, of a collaboration between Salesforce and VMware uh, to pr provide the best of breed sort of cloud environment for your applications. And of course, the um, Spring framework works on lightweight web containers like uh, Jetty and Tomcat, and of course, Spring Source's own TC server. That's a very popular deployment target. And uh, we also support traditional application servers, right? If, if you're using one of those and you, you know, if you can't escape, then uh, Spring works there just fine as well. And in fact, it supports multiple iterations. It works uh, on versions of the application servers that are, you know, eight years old, where even the current standards don't actually work there anymore, but we do. And we can still, that's one of the very valuable pieces about the Spring framework is that you can add uh, current generation features to existing middleware and to existing products. And you don't have to spend whole revenue licenses on, on new upgrades every, you know, five years just to get new features just add the new jars, it's that simple. Once you've you built your app on top of Spring, that is the, now the foundational you know, piece that you need to be able to now start to address the domain of your application itself, right? And uh, there's lots of different ways that you, you know, lots of different ways to solve a part uh, the particular problems you might have and lots of different things that we can help you do. Some of them are, of course, building web applications to, to build a presence on the internet um, and to build rich internet applications, we support batch processing, integration, uh, service tier services, and, and, and you know, both provisioning and consumption. We also support uh, access logic, you know, data access code um, for just standard RDBMSs, as well as some of the no, so-called NoSQL or uh, big data stores that are becoming very popular today. And we also support, we have a great mobile story. And you get all this by, by building on top of this core foundational Spring framework. When I talk about the foundational core of Spring Framework, uh, that implies that there's something else, and indeed there is. There's the Spring Core, which is just a handful of jars, and you can add that and, and use it at your leisure. And then that component model and the programming paradigm we'll look at today in this webinar lets you use all these other projects, right? And you don't have to learn a new component model for each one. They all just work the same. They all build on the knowledge you've got by using the Spring Framework itself. And so they're all pretty easy to get used to. Um, so as we'll see, we're not going to cover all these different projects that you see here, but you, you'll learn what you need to be able to get started with them. Uh, and you can see we've got representative projects for just about any kind of requirement you've got. You know, get from integrating with social networks to the disparate messaging brokers technologies like JMS and AMQP to uh, rich client applications like GWT and BlazeDS to services, of course, if you want to do SOAP or RPC or, or RMI or anything of that sort. We've also got great support for that. Our Web support is the best in the business and uh, infinite possibilities here, right? So don't let this list daunt you. It's a, it's a great thing, actually. The core, Spring Core is what you need to know. And of course, today we'll look at a Spring MVC as well. And you'll see that these are layers. 
that you can add. So when I talk about layers, it, uh, taking it all back home to that idea that the center of, of your application is your domain. It's your objects, your code, the things you're trying to, to solve, right? We, again, we, we talk a lot about POJOs, which is, for those of you who don't know, the plain old Java object. And really, if you think about it, uh, Java objects are they're rich enough. You know, they don't need extra interfaces and APIs and weird container callback you know, mechanisms and so on. They have everything you need to be able to build robust services. Typically, objects have a dependency graph. They have objects that they collaborate with, and they need a way to correctly manage that collaboration graph. So that's one uh, thing that if you think about it, that's something where that can be handled for you a bit better at a higher level. That's one thing that the Spring Framework seeks to do. And in this case, you can see we've got a, a supposed a repository, right? And it, it depends on a data source. Well, that's a collaboration. That's something that it needs to depend on, and it needs to have a working viable instance of that data source uh, to proceed. Another thing that objects have is, uh, have is a life cycle, right? All objects have a life cycle, and they all share uh, accordingly some notion of a, a initialization and or destruction callback, right? So they both have they have the requirement to start up and perhaps you know be be destroyed in a lot of cases, or if nothing else, they might need to start and stop, you know, or be created and then destroyed uh, along the boundaries of some other event. So for example, you might say, for every HTTP request, I want to have a new object. Well, both of these concepts, both the concept of a, of a start and stop of an object um, and of a life cycle are, are increasingly important ideas. They're very important ideas, and Spring provides first class support for that. And that, believe it or not, is the basis on which uh, you know, sort of everything else is built. And this is not a Spring thing. This is just a clean way to manage your objects. The centerpiece of the Spring framework, and, the, and yet the part that you'll probably see the least of, is the application context. The application context is the class that you can use to bring the Spring uh, container into existence, right? It expects as its input the source of configuration data. And so that can be packages, that can be an XML configuration file, it can be any number of different things. Um, and it works in all environments. I've only got Java SE, you know, a public static void main application here, and I've also got uh, the snippet you would need in a web in a web application for your web.xml. But suffice it to say that Spring works anywhere. It works in public static void main. It works on the grid. It works on the cloud. It works in a web application. It works in an EB, e, you know, EGB server. It, it works anywhere. It works in unit tests. So there's no startup and stop script here, right? Spring is just an API. It is as simple as that one little class you see there. Uh, and as long as you can give it the configuration data that it needs to manage your objects and to, to help satisfy the requirements for those objects, then it can take care of the rest. So you'll, you'll write this code, something like this, once per application, and then you'll forget about it, right? But it's also the sort of be all end all start and stop of the actual framework itself. Uh, again, getting back to that idea that uh, objects have collaborations, they have dependencies, right? You can you can think of perhaps three different classes uh, given the very great names component A, component B, and component C. Component B here needs a reference to component A, so it we say that component A is being injected into component B, and then similarly, component A needs a reference to component C. So that, so we say that component C is being injected into component A, and this is a, this is something that the Spring framework manages for you. Let's take a look at a slightly more realistic uh, sort of layering. Now, in instead of component A and component B and component C, let's imagine we've got a service, which is, you know, you very often will, and that it requires a data source, and that the data source requires configuration information, right? So that graph is, is, is already pretty deep. It's already three different objects, and you don't want to have to repeat that recipe, that the creation of those objects, that's a recipe that you don't want, you don't want to have to repeat all over the place. It's best to have that, you know, extricated in a single, extricated to a single configuration, uh, into a single definition, and then be able to reuse that in a portable way. 